Hello, spooky friends, and welcome to another episode of the Scarish Podcast. Woo! I'm Robin Grace, and this is Adam Diaz. And Hello. we've come to bring you new topics this week. Indeed we have. <laughs> I don't I don't know why. I thought that was getting really weird, and I kind of liked it. So good work on the new intro. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm really excited about this episode. I'm going to be covering a place that I did not know existed before this. Uh, so that'll be fun. Robin, what are you going to be covering this week? I'm going to be covering something that's a, a little random. I'm going to be covering haunted train stations. <laughs> right on. I want to hear how you got there. That's going to be really fun. Uh, but I guess we'll wait until we get to your topic because I'm going to be leading out this show. As a reminder, if you're looking to hear any of the emails that we've been sent, we record those episodes and we call them story time. They're recorded Tuesday, 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and you can watch them recorded live at twitch.tv slash scaryish podcast and youtube.com slash scaryish come join in the fun that is the live episodes we're always excited to see how many folks turn out and i will say our viewer numbers have gone up during (laughs) this this, covid19 pandemic which is like the worst bright side you could ever think of but we're happy to see so many of you folks joining us and we hope to see more of you because it just means that we know that you're safe as long as you're not, you know, driving and watching on your phone at the same time, which we do not recommend. If you have a story you would like to share with us, Robin, how can they do that? So you can email it to us at storytime at scaryish.com. You can also send it to any of our social media outlets. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, you can go to our website. We have a contact us page. Check that out. You can go to what I would now like to call the new scaryish.com. It has been redesigned from the ground up. In fact, I've even improved the search feature. Looks completely different. Really? Very, very proud of it. I was using the search feature today uh, just to look up like what the episode numbers were for certain things that we did. And uh, there's a ticker now. It's a little less cluttered. We have like three highlighted topics of stuff we've posted. Some of those are a little bit older for the time being. We're going to have some new up-to-date stuff. And then we have a ticker that scrolls by that has stuff like joining us on Discord or a movie list that Robin curated of horror films that might get you through the quarantine. It's actually a list that she made a while back that I think is just so applicable. I just brought it out of the archives and put it on the ticker. So check out the new scarish.com. The store is 100% working again, and it might be undergoing a brand new redesign as well. We're not sure how we're going to handle it. It might be visual, and it might be a brand new service. But either way, it is really exciting to announce that we have completely revamped our websites. Good stuff. And click on contact us, like Robin said, to send us your stories. That said, I'm going to go ahead and move into my topic for this episode. And this week, it's really been hitting me like how much we tend to go out and do things. When you hear that you're going to be stuck at home, quarantine, stay at home order, all those things, you don't really understand how oppressive it's going to feel after a little bit of time. And I don't really evaluate myself as someone who travels a lot, but I understand that we typically do travel quite a bit compared to some of the folks that I know. And I couldn't help but start thinking this week of the things that we had planned for this year. We started out the year in Mexico for vacation, which we don't do very often. Uh, And then we did a convention in Anaheim, I think, right? Anaheim or LA, one of the two. Something like that. And then we also had a convention out here in uh, Las Vegas. And we had so many things scheduled for this year. It's just crazy that right when everything was really going to pick up, because we had so many things happening at once... Uh, now we're stationary, you know, we're homebound. And I'm just like, I need to change everything. I want to move stuff around. Right before the show, she's talking about like, I want to clean the house. I want to clean the house. I want to rearrange the house. And I'm just like, do you really want to clean the house or you just want to move everything? And she's not even sure where she wants things to go. She just wants to change the scenery because we're, you know, we're stuck here. Um, and we understand it is 100% necessary and we support that. So I started thinking about the places that we've talked about going to. We've talked about going back to Japan. We've talked about going to the UK. And when I thought about the UK, I thought I should do an episode on a place. So I decided to pick one place completely at random. And lo and behold, it had plenty of history. And by random, I mean it was not random at all. Uh, I picked it based off of someone where I was like, I wonder where they're from. Once I found out where they were from, I was like, oh, okay, cool. I wonder if there's any history behind that place. And lo and behold, there was a lot. So, dear listener, I present to you the island of Jersey. Now, I know what most of you are thinking. Jersey is not an island. Well, New Jersey is not an island. But the Bailiwick of Jersey, also known as just Jersey, is an island. And let's be real here, folks. If we have a state called New Jersey... You knew there had to be an old Jersey out there somewhere. Like, oh, my God. 
they don't call it Old Jersey. It's just called Jersey. And Jersey is an island off off the northeastern tip of France. It sits in the English Channel and is considered to be one of the quote unquote Channel Islands. And the first thing that I thought of when I, I found this place was the Isle of Man, another place that I didn't know existed until we had someone reach out to us named Sam. Sam is like the OG fan that reached out to us. She's from the Isle of Man. She educated us about the islands that surround England and how there's like multiple of them. So we, we dug into it and we wound up doing an episode on the Isle of Man, which I think was like episode five. It was one of our first episodes ever. And despite being 14 miles, now we're talking about Jersey, Despite being 14 miles off the coast of France, or 22 kilometers, which is the measurement that pretty much the rest of the world uses except for the United States, uh, anyways, it's that far off the coast of France, uh, it is an independent entity, kind of. It's self-governing, it has its own legal system, it has its own fiscal system, they even have their own stamps. Uh, But in 1981, the UK claimed that the Channel Islands were part of the United Kingdom, which is a little bit weird. Then in 2003, it was said that it's not fully, quote-unquote fully, part of the European Union, but kind of is. So it's weird in regards to like where this island belongs to, but it is just sort of this independent place. So being right off the coast of France, it has a mild climate. It's like 40s in the winters, 70s in the summers. Obviously, like the record highs and the record lows are like way over the top, but the average low in the 40s for the winters, the average highs like mid 70s for the summer so it's like a really nice place to go it has gorgeous beaches and that must be why england has had such a boner for this island for such a long time like it's either that or how much they absolutely love going to war with france and the fact that it's right next to france in fact i looked up how many conflicts there have been between england slash britain because they renamed themselves uh, and france since the 1100s, and I want you to guess how many times they've gone to war with each other. Over 9,000. I hate you. Do, how about an actual guess 50. here? 50. 50? No, way too high. They've gone to war with each other 29 times. There's been conflicts within the world where they've been at war with each other 29 times where they are on either sides, or I should say opposing sides from one another. Most of those were wars directly with each other. In fact, like I'm not going to get into it, but I found out they kind of went... like started fighting each other during World War II, which was the most bizarre thing I'd ever seen. I just started going down this history hole where I'm like, I'm learning all this knowledge that can't be included into my script, so I'm not going to get too far along with it. But it's just fascinating learning about the history between those two countries. So you'd think that this island that is so important must be pretty large, but you'd be wrong. And I want to compare it to the Isle of Man. The Isle of Man is a small island we talked about that's between Ireland and England. And the Isle of Man is roughly 221 square miles. Jersey, the island of Jersey, is 45.6 square miles. For reference, to give you an idea of like what the size of that is, Disney World is 47 square miles. So Disney World is larger than the island of Jersey. So it is quite small. So, okay, I, I, uh, I'm I waiting for you to get to where you're going to be talking about this one person that you looked up this whole thing for. I mean, it's literally one of my next bullet points. Right. So I didn't. I don't know why it just occurred to me that I brought up Disney World and I didn't mention that this is a small world, but I'm just going to keep going. So <laughs> that's it. For such a small place, it seems to have quite a bit of spookiness going on to it. So let's go ahead and slap on the label up front that this could all be bullshit like we always do. But if anyone listening has been there or is from there, let us know. And as a side note, this is what Robin's waiting for. The only person that I know who is from Jersey is Henry Cavill. So if he's listening, let us know if you've heard of these before and whether or not it's true. So side, side note, he's not listening. So it, what's really funny is this guy, Henry Cavill, grew up in what could equate to Disney World because it's so small. It it can equate to it only based off of its size. size. That's what I mean. It's like, it's, you could spend a week, maybe. Okay, some people spend two weeks, but you could go from doing, doing everything in Disney World, you know, in two weeks. I can't imagine living there and having to grow up there, and it's like, oh, I've I've done everything. (laughs) I mean, I grew up in a small town. I don't know, and you grew up in Hawaii for the most part, right? Yeah, but, like, I flew places. Right, yeah. I I mean, it's not like they couldn't fly places. It's not like they didn't have planes, you know? I grew up in a small town where everything is so far apart, it's like an hour, two hours to get to some of the stuff you want to do. But not everything. So, 
you just sort of get used to your surroundings and what's close to you. Um, but like a lot of places in Europe, many of the stories that exist on Jersey, and I say on because it's an island and I feel like that sounds right, uh, many of those stories of the paranormal are tied to events of a certain time period. You know what I mean? It's not just, oh yeah, we saw this ghost one time. It's like there's actual historical events that tie these things together. So it's almost like it lends credibility to the thing that you're reading about. And, or listening to in this case. The first one that I'm going to cover is the uh, legend of Ghost Hill. So back in 1685, the long, long ago, uh, the King of France was one Louis the Fourteenth. His nicknames included Louis the Great and the Sun King, which you know he gave to himself. Uh, at this time, France was primarily a Catholic country. And by primarily, I mean almost the vast majority were Catholic but there was a certain amount of religious freedom within the country. It had been that way for like 90 years. Uh, it was an attempt to promote like civil unity and each other tolerating one another. You know what I mean? In 1685, however, Louis XIV revoked that religious freedom like officially with like government mandate. Uh, people had the choice of either converting to Catholicism or getting the fuck out of France. That was legitimately their options. And this gave birth to Louis XIV's lesser known nickname, Louis the Dingleberry. So a large group of so Protestants ridiculous. called the Huguenots got the boot, basically. Like roughly 800 to 900,000 of them had to leave the country. That was the estimated number of Huguenots that were in France at the time. And within weeks, Louis XIV started to claim that they were down to like five to 10,000. That's how many people had left. Of the many places they fled to, some of them wound up in Jersey because it was very, very nearby. And legend has it, during their exodus, they came to Jersey and wound up in the region of St. Aubin, which is the southern side of the island. They met a man on the shore who was welcoming them to the island, letting them know that everything would be okay. Which, let's be real, when you're going through a crisis, I think people really need to hear. Yeah. And he sounds like a really, really sweet guy. He'd let them know that he had a home nearby on top of a hill. And that they could get a warm meal there for their tum-tums and a place to sleep, but just for the night. So they could come on the condition that they would find someplace else the next day to stay that was more permanent. So it was like, I know you're here, this is scary, but for this first night, I'm going to put you up and give you a meal, you know? And he took these groups of religious refugees back to his place and gave them this warm meal. And a place to sit and relax and not feel the fear of being pursued or persecuted, like... A place to exhale and slump their shoulders and finally let that weight of the world off of them because legitimately they were being hunted. Like King Dingleberry had soldiers literally coming to people's houses and he gave them the authority to rough them up as much as they wanted, break their shit, or just steal from them outright if they wanted to. And they were just going to do this until they left. So for a lot of folks, they just took what they could carry and they left. They had to get out of the country because... They weren't Catholics, and unless they were willing to convert, they had to go. And now there was this man showing them kindness in a nice house that was big enough for a lot of them to sleep in, and he was giving them food. And he showed them where they could sleep, and the group of them settled in for some well-deserved rest. He cleaned up after they laid down, and he let the weary travelers drift off to sleep. And then after that, he did what all good, polite hosts do. He snuck into their rooms, and he slit their throats while they slept. What the French toast? <laughs> so after he killed them all, he, of course, stole all of their stuff. Now, I admit that I haven't studied up on Protestantism, or however you say that, in the 17th century very much, but I think it's safe to say that God just really hated these people. Oh my goodness. I'm obviously just kidding. Don't at me. It's just like they were persecuted and fled, and these particular people wound up on an island with this person who seemed okay, and as soon as they let their guard very down, unlucky. they were murdered. So, this guy was basically the first really bad Airbnb host. But there was no one left to give him bad ratings, so people just kept coming. I mean, Aragorn could have done that to the Hobbits if he really wanted to. Wow. How did Lord of the Rings come into play on this it's one? It's just like, because the Hobbits were like, oh yeah, there's this guy? Yeah, I guess we'll be cool with him, and just chill, and sleep, and be quote unquote safe and he could have murdered all of them that's true we'll see he what had other the one true ring wow we'll see what other things robin brings in here <laughs> to reference based off of what we've watched during quarantine time <laughs> so <laughs> oh my god so much sometimes people would wake up during this murder sesh because he was doing this to multiple groups of people 
Where was and he putting the bodies? They would not go quietly. Honestly, I don't know. I just assumed a crawl space, but I don't know if they actually existed back in the late 1600s. Um, for the folks who would wake up and not go quietly, the townsfolk of the area that surrounded this place nicknamed his home the House of Death. They claimed that they were able to hear the screams in the night occasionally that let them know he was basically at it again. But how come the townspeople weren't like, yo, you need to stop? Well, I mean, this guy is addicted to murdering a bunch of groups of people. And uh, outside of, like, gathering up a bunch of pick- pitchforks and torches, like, he's probably not afraid to kill them, you know? So it, it seems like at this point they're just turning a blind eye. But seeing as this is just a legend, I don't find a total number of folks murdered. Like, I can't find, like, a kill tally or whatever. Um, but it's safe to say that this guy's K to D was pretty high. Oh and my God. Okay. eventually he actually passed away and the house just it's just sat there it remained empty but the locals claimed that long after he had died they could still hear the screams of his victims on the wind at night that's definitely like how you tell a legend right you, you know? just hear the screams still coming down from that hill and it said that eventually the local community just decided together they were going to take the house down piece by piece stone by stone brick by brick And once it had been fully raised, the screams in the night finally stopped. And as a side note, Louis XIV, this horrible monarch, was also responsible for the creation of and was the first resident of the Palace of Versailles, which Robin covered five episodes ago. Wow. He was the guy who thought, hey, we should build this place that will be another hauntingly terrifying place. So Mm. it's weird how these two people connect in some way, shape, or form that... One, they're awful to this same group of people, and two, that they lived in what would essentially be a haunted house eventually, although one was much, much, much bigger. The thing that's really cool about this legend is that at the end of it, the townsfolk take the house down, so the house is gone. So it is a very small island, but you can't visit it anymore. So what do you do with the pieces? I don't know. They must have repurposed them or just chucked them into the ocean. Yeah, because I was going to say, if you build another building with those like rocks or bricks or whatever, it's like, oh, welcome to the new haunted places. Isn't it even more powerful, though, to take something that's like got this evil history and turn it into something like beautiful? That must be the mindset of people who wound uh, up cursing their homes. Yeah. So like, uh, I don't recommend doing that. So... That's the first one that I have, and I think that's a pretty solid first piece, right? Like, Ghost Hill really lives up to its name at that point. So we have this House of Death, and it's on the southern side of the island. So let's flip it now. Let's go to the northern side of the island. There's a spot known as Sorrel Point. S-O-R-E-L. I might be saying it wrong. If I am, I apologize. Please, someone let me know if I am. Just off the east side of this point, which is like, you know, up here, uh, there is a rock pool. So it's a rock formation that holds water that's basically coming off the ocean. Did it's, they create it to like collect? It's fish not been or created. Oh, it's okay. like a natural formation. Okay. Uh, it's supposedly a beautiful location if you can find it, which apparently you can if you have a local tour guide. But there's plenty of folks who didn't end up so well when they found it. Allegedly, back when folks used to travel more by ship, this was the home, so to speak, of two sirens. Named the prince and the princess. Ah, so some manatees. Yes, some manatees. I think manatees were supposed to be mermaids, right? Yeah, because mermaids I think so. were ben- benevolent, and sirens were the evil versions yeah. of them who would lure men to their deaths. And mermaids were just like, I just want to make out with that sailor over oh, there. Oh God! Okay. I think I haven't seen Little Mermaid in a long time, but I'm pretty sure that's what that movie's about. There's a whole song about it where they're like encouraging the dude to make out with the mermaid, right? Oh, are you Kiss talking? About- oh God! Okay. Shala. I love that fucking movie. Anyways. Do you really? I really love that movie. I know all the songs. Um, So here's where this thing gets really interesting. So the sirens, as they do, would lure the ships towards the coast during storms. And these ships would, of course, get ripped to pieces in the shallows. And the prince and the princess, as they are named, were nice enough to make sure that any sailors who survived the wreck were brought back to this rock pool where they would promptly drown them. And here's where the legend splits a little bit. One source I found says that sailors who were drowned in the rock pool would immediately be sent to the underworld. Another source says when they were drowned, they were taken away to France, which seems really weird, right? Like, how would they get to France? Did they drown them and then, like, throw them onto a ship and they're like, it's 14 miles that way. Like, let's go drop off their bodies. Uh, Currents? Maybe they just, like, left them to get, like, drifted back to shore, but... 
It doesn't really say. Because most legends don't have, like, all the details I mean, on what you have questions for. We just watched War... Not World... Yeah, War of the Worlds. And oh, that, the river scene? that river That's took all them scene. bodies. So Where she's just in the woods trying to pee and she just sees one body floating down the river. And then it's just... And then like a whole all, town's yeah. worth of people oh, floating down the river. Yeah, that's an intense scene. That's probably what happened with all the bodies. They just floated. You think? Floated on over. Or they went to the underworld. It's hard to tell. So, like I mentioned, this is a place you can actually visit. But keep in mind, the location has multiple names. So if you go and say that you want to see uh, this particular rock pool... There's different ways you can say it. You can say that you want to see the uh, bathing pool of the fairies. That's one name for it. Uh, Massacre Pond what the is another French name for toast. it. And my personal favorite, the Well of Death. So now we have a Well of Death and we have a House of Death. So I think that's pretty good. It's a lot of death. Yeah, a lot of death. A lot of death for two topics to start with, but... Hey, it's a small island. It's been around a very long time. So this episode's going to be fun times. What's funny is I was looking through the history of the island, and of course, during World War II, like there were specific tunnels and shelters, uh, like when the raids were happening. You know, yeah. And those tunnels, which were used in like extreme times, and I'm sure people passed away in, weren't on any of the paranormal lists. <laughs> so I'm just like, I wonder how many hundreds of years have to go by before they decide to create or a legend starts to spur up about like a new haunted location on the island because there are so many haunted locations on yeah. this island and it's just fascinating so when we do topics a lot of times some of these like types or categories of spooky creature um tend to pop up multiple times uh one of those types is known as the hellhound we've done multiple hellhounds before i think the most famous hellhound is the hound of baskerville which like everyone's heard about maybe it's because of sherlock holmes because yeah, they have that's a, how i know that's how i know of it too um, but he's one of the most famous, if not the most famous. But there uh, was also a hellhound with the Hellfire Club that I mentioned as well. Yeah. He didn't really have a name. He just sort of showed up and people would see him because there was a lot of crazy stuff going on with the Hellfire Club. Uh, but Jersey's northwest coastline, so like just a few miles away from the last one we did, has a spot known as uh, Boulay Bay. Now, I'm just saying... I've never named a bay before, but day bay. If, I, if I were to name a place that would be home to something paranormal, I'm not sure you can get any better than Boulay Bay. It's like, it's spelled B-O-U-L-E-Y, but I really wish it was B-O-O-L-E-Y because it's just so perfect. Now, I do want to point out that this place that I'm talking about, not just this bay, but this whole island, is absolutely gorgeous. This bay that I saw pictures of, if you get a chance to go... You should absolutely check it yeah, out. Yeah, it's like, this doesn't seem very scary. Why is he sending these pictures of this gorgeous right? shoreline? What's funny is the picture totally reminded me of when we were on vacation this year because we saw the sunset on the ocean. You know, mm -hmm. we sat by the beach and we watched the sunset and it was a really nice thing to do. I know you're from Hawaii, so you've probably seen it a million times. But for me, I was like, oh, this is like, this is kind of gorgeous. And I understand the appeal of it. And if you're there, I absolutely recommend doing it. But... When the night hits, when the sun is down, you probably want to head home. Is it ch 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 chilly? Well, yeah, but the black dog of Boulay Bay is said to prowl the area when the sun goes down. And like nearly all things that are categorized as hellhounds, its fur is pitch black. It's said to have large eyes, and I saw the same phrase repeated on like 10 different websites. Really? The phrase was, the, si the eyes were the size of saucers. Literally every I place mean, I read about had that description. So a saucer's pretty darn big. So it makes you wonder: is the are the eyes just abnormally large on this dog's face, or is it proportional to the face? To how big the dog is, right? Yeah, that's terrifying to think of. However, or it could be absolutely comical. It could be googly eye style. Exactly. <laughs> as a side note, though, no one I couldn't find it anywhere mentioned that this dog's eyes were red. So I am very hesitant to classify this as a hellhound. Because as we know, evil things are stupid, and they always make their eyes glow red to give them away. It's well, like a video game character where, like, their weak spot lights up. It's like, yeah, that's a bummer. Like, sorry that God made you that way. I mean, Supernatural's taught me that hellhounds are invisible. Yes, because Supernatural, Cause the source <laughs> of all... I remember the first time we decided to watch Supernatural, because she's already seen it, and I'm still on my first time through. Like, the third episode is about the Wendigo. And I had just done the Wendigo as a topic right when we started the show. And all the stuff in Supernatural was wrong. I was like, wrong. 
wrong. They're going to die. They should die. They don't know anything. Well, Crowley's hellhounds. You can't see them. So. Yeah, it's just convenient so they can just make sound effects <laughs> and not have special effects. But anyways, so this thing does not have red eyes. Now, did I mention that it does have a big chain wrapped around its neck what? like a leash that it drags along the ground? So it does have that. It's kind of terrifying. So it's not like this is a picture of something that is 100% a good guy. Are there any churches nearby by any chance? It's actually a very religious island. Like a lot of these places. Like, you know, you divide up like districts. Like here we call them counties in, in the United States. Yeah. So instead of counties, they have parishes. And the parishes, a lot of them are named like Saint this, Saint that. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's like an island of faith. Because, um, okay, I know there's a lot of references so far this episode, but... Uh, I have watched an anime called Ancient Magus' Bride, and one of the characters is like a hellhound, but it's like this dog that's been kind of attached to this church um, because their person that they cared about died or something, and they're buried there, and they kind of like guard the grave kind of thing. That's so sad. But it is a hell... It's like a hellhound. He has red eyes, I think if I remember correctly, and it's just like this spirit that kind of watches over the church. So if um, that's why I asked if there was a church nearby, because it's maybe it's like connected to the churches somehow or something like that, because I know um, that that's kind of a lore thing, where churches have these um, dog spirits that kind of Protectors that are also kind of vicious type yeah. of thing. Right on. That's a good idea. Or that's a, I, I should say that's a good like supposition for what this thing could be. Um, and you'd think like something that's like this giant phantom evil dog, I mean, not necessarily evil, but walking around a beach at night with this giant chain around its neck, like you'd be able to hear that chain and it would be your warning. You know, if you hear the chain run. Um, but unfortunately, the sound is one of the first things that you would notice. And the sound is also what paralyzes you. They really? say if you hear the sound, you're instantly paralyzed where you stand with well, pure fear. Like a siren? Like... How y- That's different. Kind of... Sirens lure you. Like, they kind of take you over and lure you to something. Okay. This thing freezes you in place. Like, just picture yourself on the beach, and you think you were something moving around, so you get up, and you're starting to walk out, and then you hear this chain, and as soon as you hear it, all of a sudden, you just can't move. But you do hear it getting closer and closer and closer. And then once you're hearing that chain just behind you, you see something dark with, depending on who you ask long fangs start running around you in circles well that's terrifying it's like a lot of predators circle their prey before they strike yeah um and that's exactly what's happening here you'd see this thing circling you going faster and faster until it's just this blur in the night and then i'm not sure what happens because according to the legend no one is sure folks that see the black dog are simply found on the ground in absolute shock no words no reactions just utter terror but they all tell the same story of what happened yeah all right so they don't remember what happened or they just don't talk about it or they leave it out i don't know but the black dog is said to have never actually quote unquote hurt anyone and again this is part of the legend that i could find everywhere they wrote about it phrases like quote no one has ever been hurt or quote no harm was ever done are everywhere when referencing the black dog and all i'm saying is that if something that terrifying stalked me and left me in that state It's provided some form of bodily harm because I'm so terrified I can't do anything. Like, I'm scared shitless. And that's probably because you pooped your pants when this happened to you. If it's this scary, you're going to lose control of your bowels for sure. And that whole, like, may not, quote-unquote, harm you, yeah, that might be technically true. But coming to with a wicked case of mud butt is not anyone's ideal situation on the beach. And it's like, you've still been harmed in some way psychologically. The skeptical folk of the area insist that this legend started centuries ago, almost a millennia ago, and was originated by smugglers who would use this cove. And apparently, there's been a port there since, and this date is solid, since 1274. That's when they say that there's been a port within this bay or cove. It's been there for hundreds of years, okay? Okay. Here's something I found super interesting, is that... I was like, well, let me look into the history of smuggling. When did people really start worrying about smuggling? Who was the first person to say, like, smuggling is a problem? Han Solo. I love you because that's two bullet points away. Shut up. But the first person that I could find in, like, this huge article about smuggling was Edward I, King of England, also known as Longshanks, the bad guy from Braveheart. What? He Never said, seen it. <laughs> He said, quote, yo, dogs, 
smuggling is like a really big problem. We got to shut that shit down. He legitimately said like the trade and the smuggling of illegal items needs to be stopped. You know what year he said that? What? 1275, one year after the port opened in Jersey. He was just like, yeah, we need to we need to shut this down. So if it was that rampant to the point where one year later King Edward was like, this is really bad. It's so safe to say that off the southern coast of England, they could have had another port where they just did a bunch of smuggling. I put in my script, you've already spoiled it, but don't ask me what they were smuggling. It's probably illegal stuff like spice, which is a side note, is what Han Solo was smuggling for Jabba the Hutt when he had to dump all his stuff because the Empire showed up and fucked everything up. What was the thing that the Onion Knight in Game of Thrones was smuggling? Onions. That's was, where oh, he that's got his nickname from, Dingleberry. Wait, why was he... Wait, okay. Why would you have to smuggle onions? He smuggled onions into a place that was under siege so that people wouldn't starve to death. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And the person he did that, he did that for the kingdom, which I can't remember what kingdom it was that he did that for, um, or what town or keep or whatever the hell you call it in Game of Thrones. He smuggled stuff in, and the person that was sieging the city, blockading it, was Stannis. So when Stannis finally took the city, he had heard about this guy who had smuggled in all the onions and made the siege last a lot longer because he rescued the city. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I appreciate what you did. However, it was illegal. So I'm cutting off the top of your fingers on one of your hands. And that's where like the tough but fair thing came from. Yeah. Okay. We have deviated away from this. (laughs) All right. My Han Solo joke was totally ruined. But anyways, it was most likely tobacco and brandy, which is probably what was being smuggled. Which is funny because, like, to this day, we have alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, the department. You know, ATF. Yeah, ATF. And this is two of those three. So these guys would have been all over that shit back in 1275. All right. So people think that the smugglers made up this legend of this dog that only comes at night. So that people would avoid oh, it. Oh, that's so smart. So they could just do their business there without anyone coming over. And then if someone showed up, just rattle some fucking chains and chase some people and they go away. That's really smart. It is. Criminals tend to be more clever than people give them credit for. I mean, that's why they get away with stuff. That's why they're criminals, yeah, right? exactly. And this legend is so well known that Jersey, the island of Jersey, actually has a stamp with the black dog on it. Shut the front door. And it's kind of adorable. Like, really? I'm going to post oh, the yeah, picture you me. Okay, gotcha, on our gotcha, Instagram gotcha. and Facebook. The dog, I think, personally should be classified as a harbinger instead of a hellhound. And I say that because one part of the legend is that when people see this, when there's a sighting and they do their whole shitting of their pants, it's a sign that there is a major storm on its way. Oh, interesting. So it's kind of like a little bit Mothman-y if Mothman made you poop your pants. Okay. (laughs) I mean, if I saw Mothman... I'd probably poop my pants. Yeah. Well, d- okay, so people have been posting pictures of the Mothman statue, right? Yeah. And With the face mask on it. Pleasant Point, West Virginia, I yeah, think. Yeah, but uh, Point Pleasant. Anyway, mm. it's Point Pleasant. Anyway, um, he has, like, chest hair. Does he? It, have you seen it? Oh, I saw that they have, they have abs like, chest- on him. Yeah, he has abs and chest hair. I'm like, why I'm is like, this statue in better shape than I am? I'm this like, is stupid. I'm sexually confused. <laughs> He's like... Mothman is both hot and creepy at the same time. What is this? I don't feel that way. I feel like Mothman <laughs> is just 100% hot. I love Mothman. Oh, my God. Okay. So, anyways. Now, I'm going to wrap this topic up with one last piece of this. So, one last story, I should say, coming from Jersey. And I want to give a shout-out to a book called Jersey Legends by Aaron Michaels. And it's E-R-R-E-N to spell Aaron. Michaels spelled the traditional way. Uh, Because there's some great stuff in there. It covers a lot of the legends from Jersey, but it puts them into these short stories. And it's really fun. It's really cool. And I'm going to do a reading of one of the free ones that's posted online for Patreon this week. Hopefully get it posted on Thursday. Because I was reading through one. I'm like, I can't include all this and I can't find any other stuff on this. But the story itself is really fun. So I'm just going to do a reading. I think it'll be cool. So patrons look forward to that on Thursday. Um, But I kept seeing in random spots that talk about the island of Jersey on the internet and in this book that when they describe Jersey, they say that it was home to the fairies. It was like one of these great homes that fairies would congregate. And a lot of places state that when humanity started to overwhelm the world with expansion and with industry, the fairies would like recede away from them because they didn't want to be near mankind. And that the island of Jersey is always described as like this last bastion of the fairies like this is like their final spot that they all went to to congregate because people were just everywhere and they didn't want to be around humans if you think about it that big circle is like a big old fairy circle which big circle 
the that big um, pond. That big that's why circle. it's called like the bathing place of the fairies. Yeah, it's like a it's a huge fairy circle. I think that's really cool. That's a that's a cool. Thing and to I was out. I was reading about that, and I was like, obviously these obviously these legends have been around for a long time about the fairies being there, and then eventually it being like this last bastion for them as like industry really started to kick up. But like late 1600s, when people got kicked out of their country and out of their homes, it also wound up being a landing spot for refugees fleeing from like oppression and expansion. And I think that really speaks well to this island and this land and like what it really represents. It's like this place for people to go. And what's funny is that I was reading this thing about fairies and I was thinking to myself, like, I really feel like this island has a lot of like magic it just feels like that to me. And I said it that way because I spelled magic with the K at the end. Wow. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. There's magic, M-A-G-I-C, which is just magic. But when you put a K at the end of that... It's like magic. It's magic. You have to say it like that. And you have to hold up some variation of fingers while you do it, too. <laughs> okay. I prefer the shocker. Anyways. Oh, my fucking God. <laughs> around the island, you can find... Not around it, but like within the island, various places... You can find what are known as dolmens or uh, men ears. Uh, a dolmen is a small rock formation. Think Stonehenge, where it's like two upright stones and then one flat slab laid across the top of it. Uh, a pie. Yeah. It's the pie <laughs> symbol, basically. They actually describe it as like a flat stone table. You know, some large formation obviously set upright by mankind or some other intelligent race that would do these sorts of things. And then the men ears are large stone monoliths. So monolith, like a single stone standing upright, like lengthwise. Like the Washington Monument? Yes, exactly. Except it's just some big stone you find and then someone says like, hey, let's stand that up. And they stand it up (laughs) and then all of a sudden you have a monolith. And these are uh, in abundance around the island. And these things are often thought to be gateways to other worlds. And there are plenty of stories out there, not just on this particular island, about people who say that they stumble into another world while they're around these things or making contact with these things. And the last story I want to talk about and the rock formation I want to talk about isn't exactly a dolmen or a menhir. It's a natural formation, which is a bunch of granite that just sticks up out of the ground. So no one created it. It's just there. And it's known as Witch's Rock, which, you know, that name just shows you that you're going to have a good story behind it. All right. So the story behind Witch's Rock is that a gentleman by the name of Hubert existed on the island once long ago. Hubert was betrothed to a woman named Madeline. Okay. Okay. Hubert was one for exploration. It said that he enjoyed taking long walks during the evening because he was all about exploring the island of Jersey. Okay. One night he was walking around and wound up looking at a tall, 20-ish foot tall outcropping of granite sticking straight up out of the ground. And he thought to himself, man, I could make some really nice countertops out of that. Did he really? No. But if it was like Jonathan or Drew Scott, oh, that's gosh. exactly what they would you think. You just always bring up Jonathan Drew. I love the property oh, brothers. I'm sorry. I love them too, but it's just so, so funny. So anyways, he's looking at Witch's Rock. That's what he has found while he's walking around. And he had been walking for a little while. And as people like to do in stories when they're dumb, he laid down next to the rock and fell asleep. Like pretty quickly, he was just snoozing. Okay. Didn't last too long. It was just a little nippy nap. But when he woke up... He was surprised to see that the rock he was laying next to was gone. He was in some sort of forested, wooded area that he did not recognize. And in addition to the geography being unrecognizable, there are also a bunch of smoking hot ladies dancing around the trees around him. So, and I mean, I just imagine it's probably some type of like fairy techno beat. And Hubert said like, (laughs) I love fairy techno. So he got up and he just danced his little heart out. He danced with these ladies all night long, danced the night away before realizing, oh shit, I need to get home to my fiance, who's there alone right now, wondering where I've been all night. So, of course, before he leaves, he tells the ladies of the forest he has to bounce, but he's going to be back tomorrow night. Wow. So, apparently, he figured out how to get home, because this detail is left out of every telling of the story that I have located, is how he got back through to get home. I'm guessing it was with, like, just some touching of some rock, like, I'm imagining what happens in Outlander that I've never yes! seen. Yes! I was going to bring up Outlander. I just know Robin and my mom are so fond of that show, so I thought I'd throw that it's in there. It's just... Okay, so the there's an episode where she goes and watches Spoilers. these women dance. Really? She goes to this um, area where there's this big rock, and she it's like... Um, 
in the dead of night, right? And that's in Scotland, right? A- in Scotland. And she goes... And this one is just north of France. Because I know that there's a place in France where the naked oh, ladies get dance. out of here. Anyway, she watches these women dance. And then eventually she touches the stone and it transports her to way back in the day, Scotland. I don't know. Uh, but it, that's what it sounds like to me. So it reminds me of Outlander. It's confirmed. This is just it's my confirmed. speculation because he dances with these ladies in the forest. He makes it through somehow. And he snaps back to reality and he heads home. And Madeline is relieved to see him, but also like kind of upset, understandably. And she asks him, like any loving fiancé would, where the fuck have you been all night? Watching the naked ladies dance. And, and he, up. Hubert tells her the truth. He decides to go with the truth. He says he went on a walk in the middle of the night, because that sounds like the truth. He fell asleep next to a big rock, because that sounds like the truth. And he woke up in a fairy-like land and danced with beautiful women all night. Okay, so what if he made all that shit up so he wouldn't get in trouble You're with his wife? You're just stealing my bullet points now. And she's his fiance. She's not his wife yet. So th- this explains his absence all night. At least he thinks it does. You know why he's all sweaty? Why he smells like beautiful women? And okay, I'm not I'm sure. Sorry, but what do beautiful women smell like? What do you smell like? Oh, shut up, bo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's quarantine. <laughs> So I'm not sure if they had glitter back then, but I'm pretty sure this dude straight up went to a strip club and had glitter on him when he came home. He's like, it's fairy dust, I swear. So it sounds like he made up the whole story at this point. But regardless of whether or not he did, Madeline believed him. And she told him very simply, you are forbidden from ever going back there. So whether or not it was fairyland or... Or strip club, that was the end of it. And it said that... It was a strip strip club club called called Fairyland. Fairyland. Yep. I guarantee you there's one out there somewhere. Oh, my God. So, it said that Madeline actually did believe his story. When he told her the story, she believed him, but there was, like, some part of her that was absolutely convinced there wasn't anything benevolent about where he wound up. She was convinced that those were witches, and they were pretending to be something else in an attempt to steal Hubert's soul. So some time passes, and it's not said how much, but I'm guessing probably the next night. And it turns out Hubert is a liar. So he heads back to the rock to go dance with the ladies again. And he brought singles this time. hey oh, <laughs> make it rain. So you know what else he brought without knowing it, though? Madeline. Because she followed him. Because she was convinced he would go back because she knew her man and she knew he was a piece of crap. So she had actually, during the day gone to her priest and let him know the situation and the priest had given her a large golden cross and when he handed it to her she asked should i recite a passage from the bible to drive off the evil and the priest replied no my child you crack their fucking dome with this beautiful piece of faith what the french toast so as soon as hubert crossed over madeline was right behind him swinging that cross like excalibur and those beautiful women Oh, they transformed to some fugly, wrinkled witches. Are you sure she didn't screeching like, in anger? She didn't like drop it in the water tank and then start <laughs> start the fire. That's alarm Constantine and... for those of you keeping track. <laughs> so these witches turned off the techno and they straight up bounced, and that's where the story ends. That's where the story ends for every telling of it that I can find with Madeline saving her fiance's stupid soul, and I'm guessing that the postscript is that she hopefully beat him senseless with a big golden cross for being a goddamned liar because he lied to her face and he went back that next night so after that it was called witches rock that's where it got the name from cool so folks say that witches and devil worshipers would gather there on friday nights or full moon or the dreaded full moon on a friday night it's also said that there is, is a full spot moon on a friday night bad well, I mean, if they're gathering on Friday nights or full moons... Oh, gotcha. All right. Then if you combine the two things, obviously the devil's going to come. So it's also said that... And that's so funny because this is the next part. It's also said there's a spot on the rock that looks like a cloven hoof print. No and printed into way. the rock. D- is there a picture of that? Um, I don't have a picture of it close up. We're going to have to go there. Um, oh. But it's stated it's one of these things that people go see. It's definitely a tourist spot on the island. And, of course, the hoof print is accredited to the devil himself. Side note, this is just one of those things. I've mentioned it before on the show. It, it's like, why is it always the devil and not one of, like, his lieutenants 
Or someone else who has um, more time on their hands. I was like, going to say, yeah, like, I'm sure he has a lot more stuff to do. a lot of do. shit. Like, whoever's There's in charge of his schedule. There's people to torture in hell, I'm sure. Whoever his secretary is in hell is doing a really bad job, which, like, is kind of apropos because he's in hell. well, maybe it's like, well, I'm just going to go and do whatever the fuck I want. You guys handle the real stuff. You know what I mean? Where I just like, feel like he was scheduled for this, you know? <laughs> and then he showed up and the witches are all excited to show him this rock. And he's like, yeah, okay, cool. And he just, like, puts his foot on the rock and, like, melts an imprint into it. And then just, like, walks away and, like, flips them off like they wasted his time. So, I'm kidding. <laughs> he just flicks a cigarette at him. <laughs> flicks a cigarette at him and leaves. I'm sure he was actually really polite about the whole thing. But there are a bunch of other legends when it comes to the island of Jersey. Which is crazy because it is so small. Despite its size, though, it's super rich in history. So, I may need... I'm probably going to have to revisit this one in the future or once quarantine is up we can just visit there when we go on a uk trip eventually which would be fantastic yeah maybe in 50 years who knows who knows how long this will take but that my spooky friends is the island of jersey thank you so much for that that was pretty good thank you i was really excited i was like all right i have I think- <laughs> enough to feel like it's almost a full episode i'm gonna add one extra story I on there to take Henry it over Cavill- the top Henry Cavill will appreciate it. I hope so. Yeah. I really wonder, like, for folks who are from this place, from the island of Jersey, if, like, this is just tourist trap stuff, or if there's, like, some credence. Like, I I know growing up, like, the local legends around where I grew up, and I can tell you, like, that one's fake. Don't go there. You're going to get possessed. You know what I mean? I mean... I'm sure it is a tourist trap type thing, and and they're just like, yeah, why would you go there? It's it's a rock, you know. I just but... want to know because there's so many listed for all these different places you can go. Like, I can just imagine asking like a tour guide somewhere, like, oh, I want to go see this. Okay, I want to go see this. Okay, I want to go see this. Absolutely not. I will not take you there. Okay. There's always places like that everywhere you go, and I wonder which ones are those when it comes to the island of Jersey. Yeah. So, but yeah, that is uh, the end of that one. So. Before we move into Robin's topic, we're going to take a quick commercial break. Insert mouth sounds here. (laughs) More mouth sounds. Welcome back to the episode. And now I get to go into my topic. It's going to be great. Uh, And yeah. Cool. Super excited. Haunted train stations. Yeah, so it's it's a really random choice for a topic this episode for me. I chose haunted train stations. And when I told Adam that my topic was going to be this, he was just like, what? Like, he was just like, "Uh, okay. Immediately, I'm like, okay. I remember Matrix 2 and 3, he gets stuck in limbo, but it's called mobile station, M-O-B-I-L, which is limbo backwards. No way. Yep. And then there's the Harry Potter train station that gets trapped in. Spoiler alerts. I won't tell you how that happens. Like, at the very end, remember, and he sees that one thing. If you haven't seen Harry Potter yet, you're yeah. stupid, but yeah. it's where he gets to see, like, the piece of yeah, himself. Yeah. Like, okay, yeah, you got me. So yeah. those are the um, only haunted train stations that I know of. But yeah, so uh, train stations, baby, we can go into it. All right. So um, Cue train noises here. <laughs> choo-choo! <laughs> so I don't know what possessed me to cover this topic, but it kind of just came to me. It was really weird. I'm sitting there, I'm like, what am I going to do? Um, all I'll say is we were sitting here doing topics and all of a sudden Robin sat up, her eyes went white and she spoke in tongues <laughs> and then she typed in some sort of eldritch symbols into Google and it came up with haunted train station. Maybe so strap something... the fuck in folks. We don't know what's going to happen yep, maybe now. Maybe something did possess me. The ghost of trains past. That doesn't work. <laughs> Why doesn't it work? You don't think... it's like trains past there, like ghost of trains present and ghost of trains future. <laughs> yeah. Coming to show Ebenezer Train Scrooge how he screwed up his life. Uh, trains don't get used that much anymore. Those poor things. I love trains. I, I love, love train trains, rides. Too. I it, literally in my script I even wrote it. I enjoy riding trains, and I've done the Amtrak. I've done uh, Amtrak. I've done the Amtrak. I've ra- ridden a lot of trains in Japan. Um, oh my god, so many trains in Japan. That so was many awesome. trains, and so many different types of trains. I think the that's bullet really train cool. is my favorite train of all time, without a doubt. <laughs> Um, Not only is it crazy fast, but when you look out to your right, depending on which direction you're going, like... Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji's right yeah. there. And it's the most beautiful mountain I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, but I have been on a, a whole bunch of different dinky trains all over, wherever I've been. So, like, Hawaii, Vegas, all those... Th- there's little dinky trains, you know? Um, my brother used to beat me up. He called that the pain train. I was on that God. a lot. Oh, gosh. Okay. But trains are cool. I really enjoy them. Um, what's interesting is the train stations themselves. They're all 
so different. I mean, when we were in Tokyo and we had to go to the Tokyo Station, it's like a huge, gigantic mall, you know? It has really good food there, like it's amazing food. Amazing. There too. And then the Amtrak station that we went to in Ohio was just a tiny building next to the train tracks. So that was like, it's there was just, like, there was no covered part of it. Like, yeah. you walk, you're outdoors. It's you like a movie. You walk up, walk up to the train. You take your bag, you step up into the train with you. It's like, if I was on a horse, I yeah. could have chased that train down. <laughs> Grabbed on the side of it and got on and then, like, waved my hat at whoever was chasing me. They're all so incredibly different. Many of them have their own stories to tell as well. Um, the first one that we're going to hop on the tracks for wow. is <laughs> prepare for lots of those things. A lot of train puns, uh, huh? So, is for Bishan MRT Station in Singapore. And just for those that are wondering, because I definitely had to look it up myself, MRT stands for Mass Rapid Transit. Right on. So, apparently, the notion of MRT stations being haunted is a thing. Um, th- like, there are a lot of different MRT stations that are supposedly said to be haunted. And I think that's absolutely, totally interesting. It's crazy because I had no idea that this was a thing. But with so much construction and so many little corners in these stations, it's really not surprising that um, people find strange things in them, you know? Legends have it that MRT stations are built on once, what once were graveyards. Uh, talk about poltergeist, right? I was going to say, like, why would you do that? Uh, Singapore is a very, very small country. It's about 277 square miles. So about four times the size of Washington, D.C. It's tiny. Wow. Like, uh, how many miles from here to California? I don't know. Like, it's like 300 or something. 300 yeah, like or something. 240 to 300, depending um, on where you're going. I mean, like, to the California border, it's not far at all. No. I'm but, assuming but you mean, to like, LA. LA. From here to... From Vegas to LA. I think it's like 240 miles. Yeah. So, this place is like driving from here to LA. That's... LA. LA. Um, it has the h- second highest population density in the world. Oh, my God. I read up on population density, too. Because um, Isle of Man has 840,000 people, and it's 225 or whatever square miles. Yeah, this is... So, if you looked at that list, uh, Singapore's number two. Macau's number one. Really? <laughs> yeah. What's cool about... Um, I mean, I'm just going to talk about it, because I have these numbers in my brain still. But the island of Jersey being super tiny, like 45 mi- square miles, has over 100,000 people. has like 110,000 people population. So, it's like five and a half times denser than Isle of Man, which is like... Eight times bigger. That's crazy. Um, this has been the population corner with Adam <laughs> and Rob, and we hope you enjoyed it. So, because this place is so small, I'm sure you'd be hard pressed to find a building that isn't built over some type of burial plot. You're you know just going mean? to run out of room at some point. Um, S- Singapore is a lot of skyscrapers. Lots. Everybody builds up. It's kind of like uh, Japan. Everybody right. builds up. Um, Bishan Station is one of the more famously known, supposedly haunted MRTs. And there are stories of strange things happening, and it's like the sight of ghostly passengers. So people just see these really strange things. Apparently, it's known to have been built on an old cemetery called Peck San Tang, and it was established in 1870, the, the cemetery was. So it was established in 1870 and existed through World War II. During World War wow. II... Oh my God, no. <laughs> <laughs> so during World War II, British and Japanese forces fought through the cemetery. And needless to say, a lot of blood was spilled in the area. And the area was even bombed by the Japanese, resulting in high civilian casualties in the vi- village nearby. So a lot of people died. So there's troops that died there, um, just regular people that were living their day-to-day lives there. Um when they began construction of the MRT in 1986, they did move that cemetery, so none of the bodies are actually under it. So they moved the bodies. Yeah. Still, I feel like spilt blood is spilt blood. Right. And it's it stays in the soil. You know what I mean? It's just, you're bound to just have some type of feelings lingering. Right. There's some carryover um, from past trauma. Plus, supposedly... The level at which the platform is actually located, because it's it's like underground, is the exact level at which the graves were. Once. Oh, that's awful! So that's absolutely terrifying. Um, super spooky. Since its opening, numerous passengers have reported seeing the strangest things. 
So the Bishan MRT station is known for being haunted by headless phantoms. And to me, this is absolutely unsurprising because during the war, Japanese soldiers would cut people's heads off. Wow, that was I a did thing. not know that. What, you did not know that? They, I knew they committed seppuku or whatever when they like were killing themselves. For themselves, but like... Um, Against other people, they just beheaded a lot of people. They, they wouldn't shoot them? They would cut their heads off? Oh, yeah. Um, they would cut their heads off, use um, bayonets and stuff like that. Uh, they were brutal. Re- There's so many books about it. There's so many books about it. But um, There's a lot of books about World War II, you say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but they were really brutal. And there is a story slash urban legend, I guess, where at one time there was a lone passenger in one of these train cars late at night. And this ghostly looking girl gets into the car and she removes her head and places it on the empty seat next to her. If I saw that, I would shit my pants. That's just absolutely terrifying. Seeing this person take their head off. Uh, oh, and just set just, it next to them. It's so weird. It's just It's like so something weird. out of Beetlejuice, you know? Um, yeah, that's so crazy. Now, this train station is a hustling bustling one. It's like... Crazy busy. And with so many people that live in one place, it has to be. You know what I mean? This station is also known to have pretty molesty ghosts. So. <laughs> no. Oh, God, no. Uh, girls report getting groped by unseen entities. In 1990, a woman fainted the moment that she left the train car. Um, because as soon as she left, like she exited the train, a number of unseen hands grabbed her goods. So there's nobody there. It's just like somebody grabbed her, like just groped her. You know what I mean? It's not just that this is a haunted train station. It's a really like rapey train station. (laughs) Like that's really bad, man. Um, I thought for sure these haunted train stations were going to have something to do. Because you told me you were going to cover some in like Asia. I was like, there's going to be something with a bathroom and something with people getting assaulted during bathroom time. Because that always seems to pop up. I mean, sexually assaulted. Wow, that's messed up. Yeah. Uh, Some typical haunting occurrences are ghostly footsteps heard as if someone were walking on the top of the train and unusual technical difficulties upon reaching the station. So this train station is underground. So hearing anything actually walking on top of the train is really unlikely. Like, how is that possible? You know, those that work nighttime maintenance have claimed to have seen coffin bearers in the tunnels between Bishan and then Novena MRT station, which is probably why people are like multiple MRT stations are haunted. You know what I mean? Some like to think that these ghosts take the trains together in order to continue causing trouble in other MRT stations along the way. And that totally makes sense that they're like, all these MRT stations are haunted. We keep seeing all these weird things. And it's because it's like, hop on the train, bud, let's go. (laughs) Right. We're going to a different place. We're going to terrify new people. It's going to be awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I just, I really want to go to Singapore one day, but I don't really want to see anything weird like that. We went to Japan after we did the Haunted Japan episode, so I think we'll be okay. I was thinking Um, about this the other day. This is the joke that I was going to make that I was hoping I wouldn't forget. It's like we did whatever the name of that woman is, the slip mouth woman. Yeah. Who's usually seen wearing a surgical mask. Yeah. And now it's like, there's no way you're going to know who (laughs) she is. Because everyone's wearing surgical masks now. You just got to carry that rice or that compito candy. I'm just going to be throwing rice and candy at literally every person I see now just to be safe. So this next one that I'm going to be covering is the Addiscombe Railway Station in England. And it's located in the Croydon area of London. This particular railway station is no longer in service, which makes it even creepier because it's a strange area of just disused tracks and remnants of walls that held up what it once was. It was a pretty large station at one point. It lived through World War II, but went into decline afterwards. It originally had three platforms, but each closed over time. Platform three closed in 1956, and then by 1996, only platform two was in use. As with most areas going under growth and change, older structures like this one become obsolete. A new station was actually set up half a mile away from Addiscombe in 2000. So it's like, we're building this new structure. Uh, We don't need to use this one anymore. We're good, thanks. We're just going to abandon it and leave it here to not be (laughs) repurposed for something else, but definitely be haunted. So the last train left this station in 1997, and it was torn down in 2001 for the East India Way housing development. 
Um, they say that the station was haunted even before it was closed. So it's not anybody's fault necessarily after it closed that caused the haunting. It's like it was already haunted. I don't know. That's why we don't want to use it anymore. Maybe. <laughs> Who knows? One worker claimed to have seen a gray figure walking from a shed. The most notable thing about this was that this figure that they saw had a blurred face. Uh, which is That's so creepy, so dude. weird. Um, when I watch, it's like the Gray Men from Wheel of Time. I know I've referenced it multiple times, but it's like they can just get they're assassins that like have their souls removed. Yeah, because you don't notice them. They're like featureless. And they walk past everyone. A woman named Marie D. Jones wrote about this figure in her book titled "Celebrity Ghosts and Notorious Hauntings." She claims that it may have been a train driver that was killed in the early 1900s. He's seen around sighting number four where a water boiler had once exploded, killing a number of workers at the same time. Some say that he committed suicide. There's just, like, all these different possibilities of what it could be. And either way, the area around sighting number four is said to be colder than any other area in the railway station, which is super weird. Suppose, I mean, but what if it's all, always under, like, shade or something? And that's why it's always cold? Who knows? Well, it had a boiler in it before, um, which is really weird because you just... I, I don't know. I mean, it's not active anymore, but I hear this place had a boiler and I think like, oh, it's going to be hot. You know yeah. what I mean? Supposedly, trains moved at the station at night, even though there was no one around to move these trains. But at the same time, I'm like, it could have been nomads passing through that were just like, let's mess with the trains. But like, I just, I, I mean, it could be anything. Trains moving is like the biggest, I don't know, it's like the most absurd amount of telekinetic activity i've ever heard of. like trains are enormous they're so heavy <laughs> like if you have a train conductor that's different you know something like pressing buttons and moving stuff yeah. i figure i i just feel like you have some sort of evidence of it though yeah i i just maybe it was if it were moving maybe it was just people that came in and were like hey we need to move this real quick or something like that it could have been anything but um supposedly it's ghost activity Others reported hearing the sounds of moving machinery in the middle of the night, even though the buildings were locked. It's said that this mystery figure has been seen since the demolition as well. Even during construction of the East India Way houses, they had issues that they blamed on the ghosts, as well as a bunch of bad luck. So diggers, while they were trying to set stuff up, kept sinking into mud and had to keep getting rescued. That's terrifying. So that's super scary. And th- It's I like mean, how everyone thought quicksand was going to be a big problem with their kids and these people had to live it. So the problem with this is they blamed it on ghosts, but at the same time, it's like maybe you should have done your soil study right. <laughs> before you started this shit, you know? So that was the Addis Combe Station in England. Next stop. Union Station in Phoenix, Arizona. Next stop. Okay, that was pretty good. <laughs> um, so this, this one's in Arizona. Phoenix, yes, Arizona. Phoenix, Arizona. So we can go to this one. I'm when quarantine. No, you can't. So you, you can't visit this one. It's not. It's you literally cannot go in there. They don't let, let people in there. So it's nearby, and I'd have to break in. Yeah, got it. So this one's another abandoned train station, one of many around the U.S. It was built in 1923 and was in service for over 70 years. I mean, I say it's abandoned. It's not necessarily abandoned, but it's just not used for trains anymore. There's no trains going in or out. Um, It has a rich history of being a stopover in America. It allowed for growth and tourism of the area. It's a place soldiers once kissed their loved ones before heading off to war. Wow. It's a pretty historic place. Um Nowadays, it's known for ghosts, <laughs> specifically that of Fred, the ghost of Union Station. So a Dudley Weldon, security and technician at Union Station, says that when you're up in the attic, sometimes you feel a tap on your shoulder. And when you turn around, there's nothing there. And this is coming from a scientist who's worked on a nuclear biological chemist team making missiles at his past job. So a man so, of science who yes. wouldn't... You know, most likely would not be prone to flights of fancy. Yes, 
And he's just like, oh, talk to Fred. Fred's the ghost. Wow. What is there now at the train station is everything that's kind of reminiscent of an older era. So even though it was closed by Amtrak in 1996, it still holds relics of time past. It's owned by Sprint now. Oh, not really owned by Sprint. It's like Sprint rents out one of the buildings and then another building's rented out to um, like a cable company or something like that. Um, and Sprint uses it as a switch center. So it's full of equipment for cell phone work and things like that, wire systems, all that fun stuff. Despite this, the lobby is still intact. There are even schedules that are still piled up at the old ticket booth counter. Wow, that's crazy. Um, Weldon is often found to be the only living human being in the building. It's really weird and eerie when you think about it that way, where it's just... I'm the only person that's living here. Um, everything else is either a ghost, bugs, animals, whatever. Wow. But I'm the only one that's like walking around doing stuff. You Are you know? saying that animals aren't living creatures? No, around? I said person. I feel so bitch. bad for all of our animal <laughs> listeners right Babe, now. Babe, don't be such a Carol Baskin. You're um, being a Carol Baskin. So <laughs> this, this is guy. What quarantine has changed us all into. <laughs> we talk shit as. We refer to our favorite Tiger King characters, as I refer to them, because they don't even seem like people. They're so bizarre. Um, So this guy, Weldon, has stories to tell. Uh, Once, there were a pair of installers in the cable room during the night, and they were working on maintenance of something together, and each of them noticed a shadow out of the corner of their eye on the other side of the room, each at different times. Um, They both say that it looked like someone was just running across the room, which is absolutely terrifying. If I saw that, And then the other person's like, dude, did you see something back there? I'd be like, we're getting out of here. Fuck this. You know, Um, there are times when a heavy side gate opens and closes over and over again on its own with no help of any type of breeze or wind or anything like that. People that spend time in the attic just feel strange things. So they feel a chill or like someone is watching them. This happens so often that employees have come to just refuse going into the attic at all. They're just like, nope, not going in there. Fire me if you want to. I'm not going to that haunted attic. Uh, Weldon has witnessed a number of instances when repairmen or installers have impossible times trying to fix or install telecommunication equipment. They struggle until uh, Weldon offers up that they should just counsel Fred on the issue. They ask for mercy from Fred. And just like that, things work like they're supposed to. Wow. Um, But what makes this place so interesting is murder. Of course. Murder. Murder. (laughs) So on October 16th, 1931, Winnie Ruth Judd, a secretary at the time, was fighting with two of her best friends, Agnes Ann Leroy and Hedvig Samuelson. Those are some names, man. Holy shit. This is 1931, man. They had cool ass names back then. Now we got like Adam Diaz. Blah. That's mean. (laughs) Uh, turns out they were all after the same man. So these three women are all after the same dude. A man who was already married, mind you. Wow. Uh, these... You would meet them at a fairy <laughs> circle and they would dance the oh, night God. away together. Um, oh, my God. We've come full circle. Full fairy circle. Wow. These ladies were fighting over a married man. Like, come on. Um, it's just so stupid. That night, Judd took it to an extreme level and shot them both. Even worse, she chopped them into pieces small oh enough God. small enough to fit into her steamer trunks. So these steamer trunks, imagine those old school trunks like what Harry Potter took to Hogwarts. Everything but the upper legs of Samuelson fit into one trunk. Her upper legs went into another small suitcase and a hat box. Leroy fit entirely into one trunk. So it's a weird thing to know, but now you know. It's like I'm going to evaluate people for the next week whenever I see them like, <laughs> Would I you think fit I could fit one them of these into trunks? one trunk. They're a one oh, trunker right there. Maybe I got to get a hat box. Who knows? She took them, the two trunks full of these bodies, to Union Station, checked her baggage on a train bound for L.A. When she got to L.A., She had a hand bandaged and covered in dried blood. When she went to claim her trunks, the porter demanded to take a look inside because the trunks were literally oozing. Like they just have nothing but sopping blood and body parts in them. That's so gross. (laughs) She decided to leave the trunks and have her brother pick her up and drop her off somewhere in L.A. 
When the police came around to ask about her, she'd been gone doing who knows what. Judd turned herself in on October 23rd, 1931, five days after arriving in L.A. The bodies were sent back to Phoenix and arrived October 24th at Union Station. For some reason, and I know this is not what they did, I saw them just putting the trunks back, back on the on, street. Back no. <laughs> Just take it back, man. They'll deal with it in Phoenix. Yeah, so it arrived October 24th at like 7 a.m. at Union Station. So Judd, funnily enough, was nicknamed the Tiger Woman. <laughs> wow. And the Blonde Butcher. Blonde Butcher is a better nickname than Tiger Woman. Yeah, but Woman. Tiger... I, I just think it's funny, Tiger Woman, because we've been watching... Uh, we just watched Tiger King and all that stuff. Judd just... mysteriously disappeared before resurfacing in Florida 67 years later under the name Carol Baskin. <laughs> oh, God, no! She was convicted and served 39 years in prisons and mental institutions. She was 26 at the time of the murders, so she was pretty young. She's younger than we are now. Um, she killed these two women and chopped them up younger, at an age younger For than we are now. For a married man, like, even. is it worth it? He's already taken, lady. Um... Maybe he was a skank, though. Who knows? They're all skanks in this story. Like, women are supposed <laughs> oh to, like, unite together and lift each other up. And I just hear a story about these three chicks, like, fighting over a married dude before one of them murders the other two. So she escaped the mental institutions six times. She escaped multiple times. It's like, if you know she's a flight risk, why would you just let it happen? You know? She's clearly um, very creative in the things that she does. Right. She's escaping six times. After her final escape in the 1960s, she was hiding for six years. She was missing for six years. She was working under an assumed name for a wealthy family. What? This is a movie, dude. Uh, right? What? This is nuts. It's nuts. This is like couch this trip with way Tiger more King murder. Shit. Way more <laughs> murder and way less um, Dan Aykroyd. She was paroled in 1971 and discharged from parole in 1983. So um, from 1931 to 1983, what is that? 52 years? That's a that's a lot of time being under the watch of the law or something, right? Yeah, dude. Um, there was a woman that claimed to be able to communicate with ghosts at one point in and around Union Station. She claimed to have had conversations with ghosts. Emphasis on plural, ghosts. But was never able to name them. So uh, it's not just the one ghost Fred, I don't think. I think there are multiple ghosts there that do different things and are just naughty dogs. You can purchase the station if you want. It's for sale. How much? Give me a price. Uh, what are we talking? For a smidge over $4 million. Let me talk to my people. <laughs> I'll Ghosts it. included. See what I got in the so, bank on that one. Yeah, so the, uh, they just posted it for sale last year, too. Um, sometime late last year. So if you want to buy it, you can for $4 million. It's all yours. <laughs> Good Lord. Um, but there are contracts. So it's like people are still paying you because they're under contract. So if you buy it, it's like instant revenue. I'm just saying that Sprint will instant revenue when you're that much in the red. But yeah, Sprint is kind of genius because they're like, look, we have to put a lot of equipment. We need a place to store all of our stuff. And these things constantly overheat. So someone find us a place so with all that's the ghosts hella that are cold. haunted that'll make the location really, really cold. It'll save us a bundle on utilities. It's pretty darn smart. It is smart. Um, but yeah, so people always want to go to this place and go in and this security guy's like, nah, dog, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so yeah, I thought it, I thought all these stories were really cool. They're really interesting because I've never thought of train stations ever being haunted. But when you think about it, people travel through these places so often and there's so much energy and there's so much going on. It's Hard to believe that nothing would ever just build up there, you know? It's a so, lot of people traveling to different points in not just in the world, but like at very different times in their life that are yeah. sometimes exciting, sometimes traumatic. And it's like any place where there's this like intersection of humanity, there's always going to be like some echo left behind, I feel yeah. like. Well, I mean, and there's definitely going to be crime happening there as well. Well, I, I'm just thinking how many train stations have had people get pushed onto the rail. Now you're and just, get crushed by trains. Now you're just talking crazy, lady. Like, clearly you've been watching too much of Unfriended Dark Web, which was actually really was fucking really good. good. Like, the first one's cheesy and paranormal, and the second one, it's not paranormal at it's all. It's not paranormal. It's, it's just all like, like, oh my gosh, I hope I'm never that person. Yeah, but someone gets pushed in front of a train in that one, too. Spoiler alerts, I won't tell you who. But yeah, I was pretty uh, impressed Yeah, with that it shit. was... It, I'm just... 
the people have been pushed onto the trains or have fallen onto the trains, and their ghosts are probably lingering around the train stations. Right. I'm going to do more train stations in the future because, fuck yes. Uh, what I will say is it makes me wonder about other, like, haunted travel, like, intersections, like airports. Like, I know the one that I want to cover is the Denver International Airport, but oh, that's, a God, that's a conspiracy theory one. one. And to be honest, I have this dream in the back of my head that one day we'll have a live show in Denver or Colorado, and that's where I want to do the topic. What so is... it would just be so cool to have it unveiled there, but eventually I'm just going to wind up covering it because there's so much to that one, and there's got to be other ones, too, that are haunted. Yeah, there's there's definitely got to be some strange things that happen at airports because so many of those terminals are dead at night. They're completely empty. Get it? Dead oh. at night. So I'm sure there's got to be a whole bunch of different places like that that just weird things happen in. And it's the one or two people that work there late at night that are like, mm-mm, this is why I wear headphones. Can't, can't, wow. just can't be by myself in the silence. But yeah, so those are train stations. I thought it was a really cool topic to do just because it was so different and I got so excited because... I would have never thought of that. I don't know why it popped into my head. Was possessed by some type of train conductor (laughs) or something. I don't know. But yeah, I I really enjoyed researching those train stations. I thought they were really, really neat. And it just made me want to go back to Japan. Wow, that's what it all comes back to is you want to go back to Japan. Yeah, I want to go. And dude, I cannot wait to ride those trains. Ride those trains all day. I will say it was a really fun topic. I'm glad whatever grand eldritch mystery of how you got possessed in this topic came to you happened because it was really fun to hear. So good work, Robin. Thanks. Good job. So for any of you out there who want to share a story with us, it doesn't have to be about our topics. However, if you know anyone from the island of Jersey, I really want to hear from them. <laughs> if you know Henry Cavill, hook it if up. If anyone knows Henry Cavill, let them know we covered a, I covered a topic that was about his hometown. Uh, but anyways, if you have a story you'd like to share with us, please email storytime at scaryish.com. You can also go to our website, scaryish.com, and just click on Contact Us, the new scaryish.com. Go check it out, folks. If you've never been there, I dumped a lot of work into it, and I'm pretty proud of it, so just go see what it looks like now. I'm pretty happy with it. It's going to be changing a little bit more, a little bit more stuff getting added on, but it's good stuff. For those of you who don't want to email us or go to the website, you can hit us up on any of our social medias. Our Twitter is at scaryishpod, our Instagram is at scaryishpodcast, and our Facebook is facebook.com slash scaryishpodcast. Robin, for folks who might want to donate to us monetarily to help keep us going, how can they do so? So you can go over to patreon.com slash scaryish podcast. Those are monthly donations. There's a few different tiers. You can check them out. Uh, I've added a couple small things and taken off some things. So you can check it out. Um, Adam and I, while we're self-quarantined here, we're going to try to make more content, new content um stuff like that for you guys if you guys want to do one-time donations you can go to coffee ko-fi.com slash scaryish podcast those are one-time donations and all those donations help upgrade our studio setup um and hopefully create better content for you indeed and i think that's everything we have for episode 122 so thank you folks for listening we appreciate you we're going to be recording story time live at 6 30 p.m pacific standard time 8 30 central 9 30 eastern over there at twitch.tv slash scarish podcast and youtube.com slash scarish on the day this releases which is tuesday the 7th of april we hope to see you there tonight if not no biggie the audio episode will release on friday and we hope you listen to that so Thank you so much, and Robin, go ahead and sign us out. Keep on creeping on, and we'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.